Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll selfishly be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. Accelerating innovation and globalization trends are disrupting global markets. We are a new generation asset management team that looks beyond traditional public markets to understand how innovation and disruption can benefit everyone. We are uniquely structured to solve the underweight to accelerating global innovation as we transition from Web 2.0 into Web 3.0. Our competitive advantage lies in the integration of our deep asset management and technology expertise under one aligned group to capitalize on the exponential opportunities of Web 3.0. The opportunities are for everyone. Invest different with Holon. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today uh, I'm pumped to be here with a Sherpa of mine, Hugh Robertson. Uh, Hugh is an MD. He told me not to say that he's a financial advisor, but he is actually a financial advisor um, and the founder of Centaur Financial Services. They're based out in the Gold Coast. He's won basically every award you could possibly win, um, so it comes with a wealth of, of experience and uh I, I am pumped to pick Hugh's brain about business, um, hiring and growth. Hugh, thanks for joining us, buddy. Thank you for having me. Good to be here. Nice uh, mate. Well, 20 minutes talking about all this stuff. So I know we, probably should, we should have had the camera fired up for that uh, that pre-chat. But, mate, I'm keen to to pick your brain um, on some of the things that have been driving your, your business growth. But before we do... Um, Keen to talk about hiring, recruiting, and team stuff because I think uh, you, like me, you know, you you recognise that at, at a certain point your your business essentially becomes your team, and particularly in the current environment, I know that you're hiring, you're looking for advisors at the moment. We've been um, on the same path for the last little bit, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a, you know a challenging proposition. I think at any time finding the right person, right fit for your business, right culture fit, right fit for the clients, all of that sort of stuff. So, um, what a good, I think a good place to start. Like, what are some of the lessons that you've learned on the hiring journey, um, and in particular, like when you're looking at advisors and and how they might fit into your business? Yeah, I think it's probably one of the big topical issues within our industry now. There's a lot of firms that have had some pretty tremendous growth. And from our perspective, it's probably also our journey was one of a small business that started, you know, one person, then two person, then three people. And so it was quite nimble, quite a lot of shared role, shared job responsibility, kind of all hands on deck approach. As, as you grow, you know, the, the dynamics change rather than being two people, like your communication is always 100%, it's bang on. When it's three people, it can start to get a bit unclear when it's four, when it's five, when it's six, ten you can really start to get uh, some unclear communication. And what that, from the, in terms of how we've started to change the business is we've had to be a lot more definitive in job roles, like who does what, what's your accountability piece, what's your responsibility piece. Uh, you know, we've had to really get ourselves into shape in terms of that and give people a lot more of a clear pathway in in what's there for them. Whereas traditionally it was probably, you know, well, our vision is let's, you know, serve clients, let's do that. Um, and that should be the answer to everything. Well, did you serve the client? Yes, you did. Great. Now we've a lot more specific. So in terms of a hiring journey, we've really evolved and become more of a business rather than, you know, just a place that helps people. Uh, we've really had to become more business minded. That's meant figuring out how we're going to structure staff remuneration, uh, bonus incentives, things like that in terms of a balanced scorecard approach, what that means for individual computers contributors such as advisors, what that means for the team in terms of the back office, how we can remunerate them, how we can sort of set set targets and set goals uh, that might not necessarily be 100% financial, 
uh, from the perspective as well, starting to be very, very clear with our, with our team on what the expectations are, you know, and, and also how are we going to grow their career here? The one thing we don't want to do is when you, when you come into Central, we want to have you for, you know, if you're an A-grade player, we want you forever. And so, but how are we going to give you your best career while here? Whereas I suppose, you know, in our, in our version one, like now I often refer to Centaur as now we're Centaur 2.0, we were 1.0. Um, but how are we going to give you your best career? How are we going to grow that? Whereas in 1.0, it was all about the client and you suit the client. Now we all know that the labor market's tight, but it's about going, all right, well, how are you going to get your best career? But in something that's also going to be profitable for Centaur, there's no point us paying out a ridiculous salary to someone, but they're not culturally aligned they're not values aligned and mm. that's been the big thing for us is just going right they've got to be a fit but if they are a fit then it'll be well it'll be good for them mate if that was 1.0 then i think we all better better look out because uh that was a pretty solid 1.0 but i still remember a conversation that we had oh, i was probably like a couple of years ago or something and and your business was set up in a way that you had you know, great word of mouth from the great work that you've been doing with your clients, steady flows of, of clients coming in. You had a couple of sidekicks that were um, guns at what they did to support you in what you were doing. And, you know, you'd go in and, and be the magic man and go and, uh, you know, chat to clients. And then the, the team would take over and, and, and sort of drive everything that sat around that. Um, what was the shift that then led you? Because your business was reasonably mature at that point like um what was the shift that's led you to push on with the the growth the advisor hiring as well i suppose I've, I've always been an ambitious person i think most people that play sport and things like that we're quite competitive and and you want to succeed and probably without your own definition of success is you just chase growth um probably a couple of things as well in is that we just grew too fast. And then when we were talking to people like our team, you know, people just wanted to start to experience different things in their role. They didn't want to be, some of them wanted to be advisors. Some of them wanted to have more responsibility in what they did. So to give them the career that they wanted, you know, we used to always joke that centaurs are choose your own adventure. So if you want to be an advisor, well, let me know and we will then bring in another client services. You know, obviously our Royal Commission, education standards, things like that got bought in. Uh, but our guys were already ahead of that in terms of doing training. So it became one of talking with the guys about what they wanted. Uh, some of them wanted to be financial advisors because they thought they might get more flexibility. Um, some of them just, yeah, that just have, have that career path planned. So probably number one, talking to them what they wanted. Number two, we just grew too fast where it couldn't be that I could be all things to all people. Uh, even with a great cast. And then you go to the point, as you know, like four kids, um, family's a, a massive driver for me. So I didn't, I don't want Centaur to be all around, you know, and it certainly isn't nowadays, but I don't want it to be all about Hugh Robertson. I don't, that's not the business we want because then people always expect to see you. Uh, mm. I want clients to know that no matter who they saw in the team, uh, they're going to be well taken care of. And there wasn't any, you know, mystique in having Hugh as an advisor as opposed to someone else. And that that's what we're really trying to drive. It's a long process when any business is typically being built by one personality. Uh, you may be aware. Um, <laughs> yes. it's, it's, a tra it's a transition that takes time. And once clients can understand that that's what the business is and you're very clear in your expectations and your delivery, then they're okay with it. You've just got to be very clear in your communication. Well, mate, you had four great opportunities to start that transition. I know I uh, I missed the first opportunity with our first child, but uh, by the time the second one rolled around, I um, did definitely use that and in, in, in a similar spot where the because I put out so much content and I end up being the face of Pivot Wealth as a brand, then yeah, people do have that expectation. But uh, like you got uh, double double the the uh, the hands full that I do with your tribe. But um, definitely, I think people understand that you know the people that you the support you are people, and I'm sure you know you've got professionals around you in your life that help you with different things. Like everyone recognizes that. I think sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking that we have to be the person and you know, no one else can do it the way that we do or support the clients in the same way. But it, 
especially as you've got a growing business, I recognize that other people can actually do it better than me because they're more available and they're more responsive and they don't have the same competing priorities and urgent things to work on um, that we do. So I, I, I've found for us that the clients have really understood that. And so long as they're confident that there is a solid machine in place that ensures that the I's are dotted and the T's crossed and there's consistency in the services that um, it doesn't matter so much who's who's delivering the advice or the jokes at the at the front end. Um, uh, yep. All of mine are the funniest, just just for the record. That's, um, that's why you have kids; you can have dad jokes now. They're funny. Uh, <laughs> exactly. But I, I I agree fundamentally with that. I think that because you built you've built you built your business on sweat equity, so you don't really know another way, and that mindset shift. Uh, to start to move yourself out of it and go, okay, the team is more important than the individual and things like that and go, right, this this will... And have, you've got to have a bit of blind faith that it will work. You've got to have that. And for me, the, the moments where I probably saw it was when I was away on paternity leave or something like that, which is to an extent, you know, we're very lucky to all be able to take some time off with our families, but it's almost forced because you haven't taken many holidays or that in years gone by. And then you start realising, you know, the team the first week might call you 10 times a day about things that happen. And then you start to, all these times you start to learn, okay, well, we need to build a process for this. We need to build a process for this. This is, so that's that's your time to go, all right, make those notes now of what needs to change so you can automate as much as possible. And then once you can build your system, there's a real beauty in that because now you can see what's going wrong and make fixes to it. So if you don't have your stuff, documented and written down now then you can never enhance it or iterate it and that's you know so we've got to get it out of our heads into software onto a bit of paper so that we can then go okay everyone like you know criticize this critique it what are we doing wrong and for us that's kind of what's happened every time i've gone away and we can't just rely on what's in my mind Mm. which is which is scary (laughs) <laughs> absolutely and sometimes you just got to wait for something to break as well because with the with any sort of service-based business or i suppose pretty much with any business like there's so many things to think about that if you even if you start with that blank piece of paper that it's you can't anticipate everything that might happen that sometimes and as much as we stress ourselves out in a lot of times that oh this thing or what happens if this or what happens if that at the end of the day if something happens or when something happens you go okay well there's something there now that's that's identified that we need to we need that process or we need that solution around it. So um, yeah, definitely I got some good advice from another business owner, uh, really successful guy that I know, um, and very different businesses. But the same thing, just get out of the way, let stuff happen, and then people will either find solutions or you'll identify that there is an issue that needs to be addressed, and then you address the issue. It's certainly a lot more. Um, a lot, a lot faster and easier than than trying to, um, yeah, sort of unpack every single potential process in your business. Um, but I, I found for us recently because we've been heavily focused on the team. You know, similar thing to you in that you grow from this like a micro business into a small business. Um, I'm not really sure what the definition is there, but a business that requires that um, extra level of uh structure around the team where it's not just you know a couple of people where you can just lean in and and um fix and adjust things um and and also that the people in the business that they're in more discreet roles that don't always understand you know every single function in the business and i found for us you touched on progression plans and development of your team and for for me that was a total game changer in that you sit down and unpack with your team you know what where do they want to go from an income perspective, from a career perspective, from a skill set perspective, from a seat perspective, but even then within the seats for your more senior people, like what is the sort of clients that they want to be working with? What is the sort of work that they want to be doing? And one of the really good things about a growing business that I've come to realize is that there's a lot of opportunity for people to go anywhere. You want to focus on operations? Great, focus on operations. You want to be a ripping advisor and just just bang out advice all day, every day, happy days. If you want to be a, an admin person to go into power planning, to go into CSO, to go into associated advisor, whatever, that it's all there. So I think as a as a leader in a business, it's easy that you see all of this in your head and you don't always articulate it and unpack it with the team. And sometimes they do, they don't obviously know all of the stuff that you're thinking about um, how the future might work. What 
Do you think, though, that on top of progression plans, what are the other things that, that have moved the dial the most in terms of your team flow and how you guys work together effectively as a unit? I think in line with, yeah, communication is expectations. So we're pretty clear that we want to be the best at what we do. So we our culture is that we expect excellence. Uh, we don't high level of accountability uh to everyone so you know we've we're not we're not in a a firm that's going to make excuses if you haven't got it done you wear it and that's that's been really important to me because i'm not someone who's good with excuses i'm not you know that's the client the client's our priority and if something hasn't got done but the reason how we can get through that is our meeting and our huddles like you know your morning meetings you talk about that there's got to be the team's always got to trust each other. The thing is, you get bigger, and as you said, these you know discrete roles, you know we've got to trust that when someone's either not in the office and in the hybrid working arrangement, if someone's not in the office or someone's you know saying that they're busy and they can't get something done today, our expectation is that someone else in the team who doesn't have as much on will go. Well, hang on, I can pick that up for you, and I can do that today. So that's how you get. But we've got to make sure everyone's trusting what each other's doing. So from the point of accountability, from the point of us having our meeting, talking about our top three things, what have we got on, what's, what are our stucks, where are we stuck on anything. Uh, simple stuff, but it, it matters. You know, today someone's away, uh, our receptionist is away, and then, you know, the effectively the person who's kind of the operations manager, she just got in and she just went at reception. She could have easily asked two people who, to some extent, are subordinate to her to do it, but she was like, well, I know they've got work to do. Um, and there will be distractions with phone calls, so I'll go and do it. And that that's what we want in leadership positions in the business, that I didn't need to ask them. They've, I've empowered them, same as what you're saying, you know, you've empowered them to make decisions, you've been, and you know, they make the right decisions. And if they're if you've got team members who aren't making the right decisions, then you know, there's a more difficult conversation you're gonna have around that. So and we've certainly been the when you talked about before the seats on the bus, for mm. me. You know, I really need the right people in the right seats on the bus. And if they're not, we'll make those difficult decisions to say, well, hang on, we won't be able to achieve our purpose and our vision, our goals, if we don't have those right people. And sometimes that might mean you get rid of a superstar, um, but that, that might be what needs to happen within your business in order for the team to grow because you need everyone, like everyone's got to be firing to, to work well. And that's that whole, you know, you're only as good as your weakest link. So you've got to, it's that fine yeah. line. I lean on, there was a, a really good book by Jack Welsh uh, years and years ago. He was the GE CEO. Oh, yeah. You know, called Jack Straight from the Gut. It was really good on management. Like it was it was one of those good books I read really early in my career where I went, okay, it's interesting. Uh, it's always hard to necessarily distill what you get from those big businesses. Like, you know, GE's got a very different staffing, HR, marketing budget to what Centaur has. So that's always challenging when you read it uh, to then go, all right, how would you apply at your level? But effectively, the teamwork and the trust, and that, that all happens in meetings. So you've got to get a good meeting and a huddle routine happening. Because uh, if, if you don't have that, then people will start going, well, where are they, why are they leaving early today? And you want to have that trust that if someone leaves early to go take care of their kids, that they've done their work. And mm. so that's where huddles became really important. It came out of, you know, so we were doing them before COVID, but out of COVID and we've just learn that when we get a bit slack on them and maybe don't do them as much, we start to, you know, things pop up and people who are stuck on stuff don't ask and then timelines, our SLAs to clients can sort of extend. Mm, totally. And it's easy when stuff is busy that you've fallen. I know that I've been there that you fall into that the trap of going, oh, I'm too busy for that meeting. But it's like it's those times now business coach has been t- banging on about this for years that's like those are the times that you need to double down on meetings and be doing Mm. more meetings because there's more stuff going on and more things that can slip in the absence of them so um, that's definitely been uh, not much of one for internal meetings I like to get stuff done like historically that I always want to focus on that but I've realized more and more that it is mission critical to how we work together because like you say you can have superstars that are great at a role but if you're not great as part of the team, especially in a service business where it's like you've got a lot of people touching parts of the process and the work yeah. and, um, yeah, it's just all uh, mission critical to a- achieving collectively the the output that you want. Hugh, I'm keen to shift gears a little bit because I know your business has been around for a long time. 
Um, I know you look very youthful, incredibly, in fact, but um, uh, there, there's a bit of longevity there. So tell me, what's, what would you say when you think about what you actually deliver for clients, what's, um, what's changed over that time? Yeah, good, good question. The evolution has been we've become more expert at what we do and we've got the confidence and conviction in what we say. I think when I was younger, clients would second guess a lot of things because I'm, I want to get along with people. My, my natural personality is to want to be helpful, be friendly. And in our world, that can be quite, quite troublesome when people say things that you know, oh, we're thinking this, we're doing that, we want to do this. And you're a young, you know, maybe you're in your mid-20s um, or late 20s and you're kind of there going, oh, I, I wouldn't do this advice. And but you kind of go, well, it can kind of work. And if you do this and then maybe the outcome isn't great for a client and then they're kind of like, oh, well, you didn't say don't do it. And, you know, I'm not sure that I ever went down that path, but I certainly felt like that a long time uh, early in my career that I just didn't want to say no to people. And <laughs> then I kind of, after having a few years in the seat, I started to, you start to get trends of personality types and you start to get trends of, stuff where people can lose money and and you sort of realise that there's 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 a reason long-term principles are long-term principles. They work. And mm. so evolution became really distilled to knowing what the principles are, making sure we're always well-educated. And then really, for us, we really just started targeting on people's goals because it didn't matter if, if you're, you know, we, we still sort of go on about if you're going to get, you know, what's the difference between a 10% return and a 5% return if you don't know what you're gonna you're trying to achieve? If you could get there with less risk, why take more risk? And so for us, the big thing on that was really start to engage with clients with conversations around what's important to them. Uh, and this kind of goes to what the whole values-based advice is and all of these goals-based advice. And but it seems intuitively that's what that's what we should be having the conversations with clients about. And if we're experts, we will then be able to provide the solution for them to achieve their goals, not necessarily achieve a financial outcome. They got 10% this year. Well, what does that mean? So mm -hmm. probably, you know, going through goals and really starting to provide some context around what they're trying to achieve, what's the importance of it. And that that has really built us into being the trusted advisor. So you look at, you know, our referrals by clients and all of this is still really high, but it's because they trust our advice. Market's going volatile right now. We're communicating to them saying, look, you know, this is what's happening right now. We're not we're not saying the market's going to be great. We're not saying it's going to be bad, but here's communication. So you're not going to have to turn to someone else when markets are bad. And one, one of my sort of always peeves has been when things are good, people are saying, look what I did for you. Look how good we were for you. But then when times are bad, there's we get a heap of clients say our advisor doesn't return our calls. And I think, mm -hmm. like, and if, if I get someone... If we get a client in our door where the client hasn't returned the call or hasn't seen them, then as far as I'm concerned, they've forfeited that client uh, because that's and I people in that in that are in our industry, I want them to hold themselves high as professionals, not not to duck duck from clients because they're trusting us with their life savings. So it's not an insignificant role. It's not. Mm. I think I know it's we're in a pretty stressful job, but from from our point of view, I think it's just been the evolution of us taking on the role as the professional. And now sort of having that experience to be able to say, hey, this is what you should do in this scenario. Uh, and we, even if you look at our website, we talk about, you know, we're trying to maximise the probability of you achieving your your goals. So it's not, you know, we're not going to double your return. We're not going to give you $10 million. And even now with the language, I sort of think, you know, the goals that are possible for you, like, because you can't just go, well, I want a Ferrari if I'm on 20 grand a year necessarily. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, well, and that's the and and being honest with people if they can't achieve it tell them because that's yeah. I'd rather know and I always think if you went to a doctor like a specialist I'd want to know early on what was wrong I'd I don't really need to know the surgery or whatever that they're going to do I want to know the outcome and I think in terms of advice it's the same they don't need to necessarily know the ins and outs of everything we do they just want the outcome absolutely and I think that the um the reality like you say that some people can't do everything but i was fortunate that one of the lessons that i learned early on from another advisor that was mentoring me um in my first role in the industry was to talk about what you mentioned where people are doing things that you know is there's you know there's decisions that are consistent with what you would suggest 
there's decisions that are not necessarily bad decisions, but just inconsistent with your philosophies. And then there are decisions that you think are, are bad decisions. And um, yeah, the lesson was that any time, like di- making sure that you're uh, sort of discussing those differences with clients and especially calling out when someone's doing something that you think is a bad idea so that if it does turn around and bite them afterwards that you can say look it's obviously it's up to the client they're making their own financial decisions but Mm. when at least you've called it out to say look I wouldn't do this if I was in your position of course you can Um, but then that way you you're sort of giving them that that foresight and yeah uh, yeah ultimately helping them to make their own their own call but not um, being on the hook or not saying not saying anything because I can say that you are the trusted advisor. Well, and you've been through the net. You've now got client stories too. So as we as you go through it a bit, you can say, hey, I saw the guy before the GFC that never wanted to put small business owner killing it but never wanted to put money into super because he said his business was his super. GFC wiped his business and he had no super. So, you know, I, I wouldn't want to see you go down that same pathway. And those those stories help because a lot of people can't put the numbers together, you know, as well as mm. someone like you. So, you know, it's about... It's about necessarily giving them some case studies of sorts, client stories, and and again that builds trust. You can you don't need to say no, don't do it, but you can say, hey, I'm I'm concerned for this. And I think also learning to ask more questions. We don't necessarily have to have the answer for everyone. Sometimes it's just a all right, let's talk about it. And there is no answer that you can give. And I think some of the junior advisors might think that they've got to be the expert. And I think if you went and saw people who they might see as the experts. Half the time, those advisors are in the room saying, oh, I don't know the answer, but what do you think? Mm. And that's okay. That's an acceptable answer. Absolutely, yeah. I think it's, it's certainly when you're earlier on in the piece that you always feel like you need to even responding to clients' stuff in meetings. Like it's okay to just go, oh, I don't know the answer, but I can find out the answer. Yeah. Or that's one that we don't have an answer to and, and we're just guessing, but maybe let's guess together and see see what we think. Um, but I'm keen to, because I, I know that you're um, heavy into the goals-based advices. You touched on your um, finalist for the, as the, in the goal-based advisor award for the, yeah. last, for the last couple of years. I think you won it once back in, was that 2010 or um, yeah. something like that? So I'm keen to understand because I can't get a look in for those awards. So. Well, I'm keen to understand what makes because I feel like we talk to people about their goals all the time. Obviously, that goes into every um, document, but what is it? <laughs> yeah, no goals. What what goes into being a goal space advisor? If if is that the question? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, cruel, cruel. It's um. So, from, from our perspective, is it's it's hard to sort of fundamentally that that's what we believe you've got you guys like your jim stack pool uh running through certain advice you got back rack running through values based uh, you got george kinder running through you know his questions uh, dan sullivan running through their questions you got licensees trying to introduce this all these sort of frameworks that, that can help and that that's great that's powerful uh, i think from the perspective i think even i know you can measure goals and sort of start to say mm-hmm. there but from us fundamentally it's just always been the way that everything starts with the client in mind so even if you went on our website the first thing before you see an our services tab you would see a your goals tab because that's what we focused on so when we're talking we're never talking about us we're talking about them uh when we you know whether it be a smart goal or whatnot we're very articulate in setting that goal and tracking it through every meeting to how they go whether it be through projection software to say, hey, look, you're tracking well, whether it be through uh, some feel like, you know, some people have made the forms up uh, around, you know, how do you feel you're tracking towards your goals? I really like that as a concept to say, do you feel, you know, where do you where do you feel you are this year and then the next year, how do you feel you've gone? Uh, years ago, we created a spider wheel on that uh, to, to implement that every year is on my list to implement. Um, because I don't want to, again, we don't want to get too, every year we want to revisit the goals and really go through, have our nice, have our chats, do all that, and then say, okay, here we are. What's what's the goals? And what we do, uh, that I'm sure everyone does, is we will have all the goals that we've achieved historically as well. 
because sometimes initially we used to take them out and go, right, what's the future goals? Because we're always looking forward. Uh, mm. But then we started going, hang on, that's not really great for clients because sometimes they need to reflect to be proud of themselves. So one of the things we want to do totally. is, you know, really experience that, hey, we've done this. You know, we've done really well. And for, for us, there's also the business side of that is showing the value that we've added to them historically mm. and now and going forward. So I, th- I think we're really good at being a, a bridesmaid the last few years in, in Gold Coast. Um, <laughs> but we'll be there again. I, it's one of those ones I, I really like. Mm, I know. Yeah, I know from all of those um, angry text messages that I get on AF- IFA awards <laughs> finals night. Yeah. Practically, how do you track those goals, though, Hugh? Hey, how do we track that? Practically, how do you do it? Well, really, you've got in our client data form or software or not, whatnot, it's, it's on the system. So we've got there to be able to say, all right, you've reduced your home loan by 300,000 in the last six years. This is what, you know, we, our projections were that you would have decreased it by $400,000 or, or whatnot. So, uh, really it's legwork. It's grunt work. There's not an, or I've looked at, there's some great software in the States that I've seen. Um, mm. that would be game changing. That would be amazing. Uh, and just being able to link that into, you know, accessing the probability of achieving your goals using, you know, some Monte Carlo simulation stuff that you go, that's really cool. Like I would love to spend time with a client going through that. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want that to dominate the meeting. I just want it to be okay. Look, let's go through. Here's where we are. Because once we get through that historic, what we've been. And so the, the short answer is it's in our review document as to from what, where they were. We don't track it year by year, but we've always got the old review there. Um, we, so it is tracked. Um, but then we can go, okay, now what's going forward? But I've, I was just thinking about this the other day um, as I'm preparing my goals-based advisor submission for this year. Um, <laughs> is, is effectively, let's find that that software that we can really start going to clients with and saying, hey, mm. this is... Uh, because what I would like, I would like them to be able to access it when they're not with us. There's, there's an ability for me because like anything, whatever's in front of mine stays there and... Even though, well, see, wealth creation is different because we're long term by nature. You know, have mm. enough to retire on, pay your mortgage off, um, get a new car next year. So those aren't things. That, it's not like weight loss goals where we need to put that in every day, every week. Uh, but if there was something like a quarterly reminder you could send to clients, something like that, I think that would be, you know, really nice. Where it, it might be that we have to spend twenty minutes just collecting the data. So if there's any tech guys out there, that'd be pretty cool. Mate, I love the idea of tracking, of showing the clients the goals that they have achieved because I we do talk about it, but it's the nature of, I think, people, but um, people that high achievers in particular or people that are future focused, we're always looking at the next thing and the next thing and sometimes just reminding people and going, hey, you've actually done all of this. Like, that's great. Well done. Keep, keep at it because this is working, whereas otherwise people are going, oh, I'm not there yet or I haven't done this thing yet or I've still got this mortgage or I've still... Um, you know, not have the passive income the where I want it to be. That um, yeah, it's a, it's a great shout to show that progress. And but um, the busy people don't don't look backwards. Successful people don't look backwards because they are they're just future goal oriented. So mm-hmm. if you want to say you paid your home loan off, and then you say this is all that hard work that you've done. This is what mm-hmm. it's giving you, and it it also gets conversation happening. So when you talk about to a retiree couple about estate planning. And, you know, they will say, I oh, know we're fine, but you revisit it every year and then you find out one's going through a divorce and, you know, there's an element there that they want to make sure that the estate is more secure. So going through the goals leads to the advice, you know what I mean? But if you went through, all right, mm-hmm. how's your estate planning as a question? Yeah, good. They, a client doesn't know the consequences or ramifications. It's not their job to know. It's our job to go, okay, let's have the conversation through goals and say, oh, okay, well, actually, this is it. And then there might be, well, a story to go with that of actually there was this client who didn't and this is what happened, so we're going to make sure we protect you. And they go, yeah, that actually is a massive goal of ours. And Morningstar have released research about, you know, having a list of topic of goals um, and clients going through that and refining that. There's heaps of stuff out there if you sort of Google it, but you've got to find what works for you. For me, it's more through conversation um, and having those so a bit of track record stuff. 
to go through, but that works well for me. I would love if the technology had something. I reckon that could be a game changer, but there mm. are software providers out there, I think. Yeah, I think we it's um it still blows me away because we've been looking at our tech recently that there's no um silver bullet there like w- with that stuff that there's there's so many possibilities. We hear about all this technological change, but um the one that's that's going to do the things that we needed to do, I think, is is yeah. still around the corner. So um, the maybe if you find it, let let me know. Yeah. Um, but mate, I could honestly talk about this all day, especially the um, the disappointment of you not uh, not quite taking out that award each and every single year. But my last question for you is that um, if you could if you could go back to uh, that little baby Hugh day one of opening the doors of your business and give them one piece of advice, what would that be? Yeah, good question. Probably get get structured earlier than you think you need to be and hire earlier than you think you should uh, because I was always reactive to start. There was, you know, we had sort of, we were helping two accounting firms that put their clients in a lot of unlisted property. So we thought, oh, this will be a value add us taking over and helping these clients that have lost 80 cents in the dollar. And it turned out to be two years of absolute heartache. We never got a benefit for for it but we we wanted to fix it and then so i would have starting again i would have not done those two years but really <laughs> built, built that structure every time every time we saw something happen i would have built built the system for it and gone okay might have started with you know the have been clear on my investment philosophy uh start with index you know don't don't try and if you don't have the capacity to do more start there you're not going to win on performance necessarily if you think you're going to win on performance great go for it uh, but that's you know, not many do. I, I believe that you can, but there's not many that do. But the, and then hire people, hire people, and be clear with, hey, here's your role. Do that. If if that was where I went, we had to clean out a couple of staff members back then, uh, and then I got one who was great and was with us ten years. And it would be, yeah. And to hire the right ones, you don't. I remember I was thinking about this the other day. It was it was like I used to have to beg people to come and join Centaur, and I had to really sell them on the vision and the dream of centaur and that's changed a little bit now and i um but i remember i I probably wish we were a bit more structured that i wasn't you know just come and you can do anything just please join and and it was effectively i'm saying trust me that i can build something and they did now i'd be more okay this this is what a business a financial planning business is and this is what we need rather than you know this is what Mm. what i want so a bit more structured and employ earlier I wonder if there's any correlation with that moving away from the Hugh Robertson show and the fact that you had to stop begging people to um, come and join your team. Maybe maybe something to look into uh, into afterwards. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, well, you need to, what's your thing? Uh, yeah, look, I think being, I think the be, probably being clear, similar to what you've said, that you always got to be thinking two steps ahead of where you think that you should be. And I think having the vision for the team, like that org chart structure, like what are we actually doing? Who are the people that we need to do that? And what does the future business look like? Because I've fallen into the, um, the, the I suppose, the easy solution that you go, well, there's a need. Um, I'm going to bring in someone to fill that need. Whereas when I've and I've even just done this recently that we had like we've got a we've got a an offshore team of seven um we had a like a new business admin sort of like a CSO person that was supporting it. and we have this pod structure it's like advisor associate new business admin and then we've got a power planner and implementation on the side and I've realized that I could actually just put the power planners who'd be better at the admin role it means less hands touching the work and then they can do it to a they have more detailed financial services knowledge because they have that background in in financial planning um, and these little things. And I was like, gee, like one thing that was costing me a bunch of money. The people that I had in that seat are great people. We keep those in the business for sure um, and and shift them to something that's going to be more consistent with where we want to take it. But it's those smaller shifts, even the pod structure, that was something that we implemented back end of last year to go, okay, we've got a dedicated unit here that's now going to deliver the work. And I think that if I had known all of those things, thought them through and planned them out in advance, I I may have sort of shifted the the hiring or the skill set a little bit or done it at slightly different timing. Um, 
and it would have been, yeah, I suppose more supportive of where we wanted to go instead of, like I say, just filling it, filling a need because there's a need there without thinking beyond that. But it's hard to know. There's so many things there, like you said, that sometimes you got to let things break and, and <laughs> realise the opportunity as well. I think that's when we all start our own business. And, and if we are to say that we've both been successful today, you kind of go, you never, we were ambitious to want it to be successful, but you didn't, there was no guarantees. You could have failed and it was grunt work. It was sweat to get it. And then mm. it's, it's kind of that old aim, you know, now you go from working in it to working on it and being a business and thinking like a business owner, whereas back in the day, you didn't want to ever lose a client. You know what I mean? Now you go, well, actually, we might not be able to best serve you. And yeah, those are the things I would have liked to have maybe had a bit more confidence in the future that it would have been maybe the business planning process of kind of creating the future that you want mm. would have been not, not just, you know, the normal business plan templates you get that are junk, but actual have a one, two page, five page plan and go, this is our clients that we're going to serve. This is how we're going to do it. This is what we're going to spend on. Maybe yeah. that's the idea. Definitely. And I think that with hindsight, you see that if you'd just done a couple of things differently, that it would have not ha been as stressful or, you know, not got to the to the pressure point that it did that made you come to that realisation. But I suppose like we were saying with um, team stuff that you can't always anticipate everything that's there. So as uh, I was actually talking to um, Corey Wassell the other day, I interviewed him on the podcast as well. And we were chatting a bit before we fired up the camera and um, I was like, I was talking about our frustration with hiring. I was like, man, it's like, it's killing me. Like it's, um, it's taking longer than I wanted. And he's like, yeah, he goes, but that's the, um, he goes, that's all part of the fun. Right. And as much as at times you just go, well, um, yeah, to look, it is annoying and you, you see these things, but at the end of the day, these are our problems. And we're, we're, uh, we're pretty fortunate to, to just yeah. have that. So it was a good lens. I've sort of uh, had that one ticking over in the back of my mind um, over the last couple of weeks in those in those times. So, yeah, being so, able to put things in perspective is very totally. Well, Hugh, mate, thanks for joining us. We're wishing you all the best in the Goals Based Advisor Award for this year. So, Russell, if you're listening, mate, give him a look in. He's um, he's, yeah. he's 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 all about the goals. So, thanks, buddy. Appreciate. No worries. That's great. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>